Well, um, you all read the uh, profile of Toby Walsh, which means that I don't have to speak in other words. I can simply hand over to Toby Walsh and do his talk. Ladies and gentlemen, Toby Walsh. Here we go, Toby. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that's been probably the most um, amusing and exciting introduction I've ever been given. Um, and I'm pleased that someone mentioned that I was runner up for the arms control person of the year. I'm very proud of that. Um, what you might not have noticed is that um, the person who came third, um, and the reason I'm most proud of being runner up was um, the Pope came third. So it's the only competition I'm ever likely to have beaten the Pope in. Uh, and I'm sure the Pope is sitting at home wondering how he was beaten by a, an obscure uh, AI professor he'd never heard of before um, in the arms control person of the year. So that's uh, one of my pr prouder achievements. So I'm going to I'm going to make my suggestion as to which quadrant you should be in, um, and um, uh, it's not one uh, that seem that you see people seem to have been voting for very um, very popularly. So I'm just going to put up my slides, um, and um, it's a talk of two parts, um, and so it's two different um, use inspired, and this is starting to give the clue away, uh, use inspired um, basic research. Um, so these are two problems I've been working on the last couple of years with some colleagues. Um, they are um, driven by a very, some very practical applications that I'll be spending some time talking about. Um, but oh, interestingly, they've, they've actually motivated some pretty deep fundamental research that has advanced our understanding of these domains. Um, and that's the Pasteur quadrant. Um, and I think uh, if, if you're not convinced um, yet by my by my persuasion um, I should just point out of course Pasteur uh, is famous for having invented inventing uh, vaccines uh, he um, is famous for, of course inventing the smallpox vaccine he um, used chickenpox uh, so, so, uh, to, to invent the smallpox vaccine and if there is one thing um, that science is going to help us with the most value in the next uh, year or two it is the vaccine for COVID. So I, that is not an, uh, a, a proof that the most important quadrant to be in is, is the Pasteur quadrant number one uh, in JJ's diagram. I don't know what will be, but maybe you'll listen to my talk and be further persuaded that when you're thinking about your research, maybe you should be looking for some use-inspired basic research. So talk of two parts. The first half of the talk, I'm going to be talking about um, an online fair division problem. This is um, problem that came to me from the Organ and Tissue Authority of Australia. That's the government body that's in charge of allocating mostly uh, deceased organs. Or people, people, when they have road traffic accidents and the like, donate their families, donate organs, and they're matched to donors, people um, with kidney disease or heart disease who need um, a new kidney or heart. Um, and what's interesting from a theoretical perspective about this problem, that one of the aspects of the problem that we looked at is that it's, it's what a computer scientist would say is an online problem. Uh, it's online in the sense that you don't have all the data when you're trying to make the decisions. The organs arrive, as people have these road traffic accidents typically, and they've got to be donated. And you can't wait to the end of the year when you actually could look at all the people on the waiting list, all the organs can be donated and say, well, actually, here's the best matching. It's a, that's actually a simple, simple polynomial problem at that time. It's a, a, some sort of weighted, fair matching problem. Um, no, you actually have to start matching organs and you commit to those matches now and an organ may come in later or someone may join the waiting list and you realize wait a second that wasn't the match i just did wasn't the best one i, mean, I could have done the best use of those limited organs um, and then when we started looking at this problem we discovered that actually there was a whole host of practical other problems that were online that that theory at least hadn't really been looking at hadn't been looking at these problems as online they've been looking at these as offline problems where you had all the data um, so we've also looked re recently at um, a problem with electrical vehicles, which is allocating the vehicles to charging slots. Again, this is an allocation fair division problem. You want to do this in a fair way. But again, it's online. You don't know who's going to turn up at the charging stations, but you've got to commit to giving them some uh, a charging slot. Uh, and then a third problem that we looked at, um, we've been looking at currently at the moment, another online problem, which is uh, another somewhat practical, sadly practical problem of the day, uh, which is allocating refugees to cities. So people flee 
uh, famine and disaster and civil war um, and end up in new countries. Um, and those people typically get distributed um, around different cities within those countries to spread um, the arrivals around. Um, and there are constraints as to where they can go. Um, maybe there, there are a limited number of hospital places or school places um, and the particular areas that they have preferences over. So this is another um, like fair division problem. Again, it's an online problem because people are arriving all the time and we're having to do the allocation before we know exactly what the future demands are going to be. Um, and a fourth one, haven't actually looked at this one yet myself, but is, um, is one that does turn up in practice, is assigning people to social housing, public housing. Um, again, it's an online problem because um, you've got to do the allocation as, as people arrive and depart from, the, from their houses. Okay, and, and what's interesting about these, this problem is, I mentioned one aspect of it, it's, it's an online problem, uh, but there are a number of other features of the problem that you really have to take into account, um, otherwise you haven't got a practical solution. And it turns out those 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 practical features um, actually have uh, turned in, into a much more interesting theoretical problem. Um, and um, I've got a couple of those features on, on the slide here, different blood types, different age groups, different geographical regions that you're doing the transplantation in. Um, I'll focus just on one, but all those other features are also important to take account. But just to show you um, how those features um, really do change the character of the problem. Um, so blood type. So you, you're probably aware of the fact that um, you have to have um, blood type compatibility. In fact, you have to have more than just blood type compatibility, tissue type compatibility. But but um, that requires um, a nested condition is is um, blood type compatibility. You can't um, you can't put a, an AB organ into someone who isn't of AB blood type. Um, and here, so there are four main blood types you're probably aware of: blood type O that most people have, blood type A slightly slightly rarer, slight, slight blood type B slightly rare again, and the rarest of the two, rarest of the four blood types, blood type AB. And on this on this graph, you see a different proportion. Um, this is the proportion in Australia; it'd be similar in in most Western countries. Um, there is there there is um, some genetic um, diversity to this, so it does it does change a bit around the world. Um, the green bars are the proportions of blood types in the donors, the organs being donated, the kidneys and the and the and the hearts being donated, and the light purple bars um, is the proportion of the population. And and actually, not surprising, the purple bars and the green bars are almost exactly aligned. Um, the um, you know, road road traffic accidents affect people. Um, independently of their blood type, not surprisingly. That's not per perhaps surprising. The orange bars, though, are different. Those are the recipients, the people, patients waiting uh, on the waiting list for, for, for organs. Um, and that's actually slightly different. And that's actually that's actually a really important uh, observation to realize that it's slightly different. Um, where it's most different is if you look at blood type B. There are approximately 10% of the population have blood type B, um, and donors about 10% are blood type B. But 14.4% of the waiting list are, are patients of blood type, the, the potential recipients are patients of blood type B. That's a huge, great disparity. It's almost 50% bigger than it, than it should be. Um, um, and um, that's, that's something you really have to take account if you're going to design a mechanism for allocating organs to, pe to, 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 to patients. And because you've got a much bigger waiting list, proportionally speaking, for um, for the blood type B. Um, so they're disproportionately represented on the waiting list, which is a bad news, I hate to tell you. If, if you're one of the 10% of the world who's got blood type B, that's, um, and it will be similar probably in your country as it is in Australia. And that's very bad news for you, I'm afraid. That means um, that you're at a significant disadvantage to people of other blood type. Um, um, and it's only uh, when I saw the data and analyzed the data and, and went back to the surgeons, I said, you know, you should probably consider um, may, putting some more effort into getting um, people of blood type B to donate um, organs to compensate for this, this waiting list. Um, blood type AB, which is very rare, actually there's a slight excess um, of organs compared to, to patients, recipients waiting. Um, and that's because medical profession, and probably because medical professionals are very aware that this is a rare blood type. And so when someone turns up into the ICU um, is potentially, um, you know, on a on uh, being on life support and, and um, they're thinking about um, organ donation, um, someone of a rare blood type like that is is um, oft, often focused on. Uh, perhaps um, people of 
blood type B, not being that rare, but nevertheless a bit rarer than the rest of us, um, they don't get that sort of attention. Um, it also suggests, um, I wondered actually when I saw that, when I analyzed the data, whether there's actually some um, uh, medical, um, as, as actually a, mis a typo in this um, slide, a medical disadvantage to having this blood group. Um, and there is actually, there is some evidence, um, some, some genetic evidence suggests that people who have blood type B uh, tend to ha have more kidney disease in particular. Uh, these, these, I should say that these, these, these numbers are actually all for, for kidneys, not for hearts. This is all for kidneys. Um, um, now, what you, one thing um, you probably do know as well is that, that um, blood type O are universal donors. You can put blood type O in anyone and there's no reaction, but you can't put um, blood type AB in anyone. You can't put blood type AB into anyone, but, but, blood, um, but, but people who already have blood type AB. Um, you can put O into A, O into B, and O into AB. You can put A into AB and B into AB, but you can't put A into B or, or, or any of the other combinations. So you, uh, you can take some of the O organs and, and, and give them to the people of blood type B to try and, and, and make it a bit fairer for those people. Um, and that's something that we will talk about um, very shortly. But that's, um, that's only going to make it a bit tougher for blood type O, because if you actually notice already that the, the green bar is under the orange bar for blood type O, so there are already slightly fewer proportionally um, uh, organs being donated than patients um, for uh, waiting for blood type O. So they're, they're already um, slightly disadvantaged. And you could take some of their organs to balance out the Bs, but that's only going to make life worse for the Os, and they're not going to be very happy at all. Um, OK, and you can actually work out, and this is one of the things we could do. We actually work out exactly what is the optimal um, flow of, of organs um, between the different blood types. I mean, you could set this up as a, as a, a beautiful little linear program. Um, so the linear program is built up of a, a number of decision variables, these x variables. Um, and and uh, they tell you the fraction, these are all fractions, all these are fractions, so they all add up to one. Um, and they're the fraction of organs and fraction of patients of particular types. Um, so we can take uh, XOO is the fraction of organs of type O that are going to um, be donated um, into patients of type O. XOA are the fraction of organs of type O that are going to be donated into patients of type A. XOB are fraction of organs of type O that get donated to patients of type B. And XOAB, fraction of organs of type O, donated into patients of type AB. Um, there's a um, conservation law there. Organs are neither created nor destroyed. Um, and so the sum of all those type O organs must equal the proportion of organs. This is a constant, uh, little o, o, the proportion uh, in the population of organs of type O. Similar um, mass balance uh, conservation equations for um, organs of type A. That's the second equation. Similar mass balance equation for organs of type B. Similar mass balance equation for the um, organs of type AB. Those have to; those can only go into patients of type AB. Um, so those are the conservation laws. Now we want to make things as fair as possible. So we've got a bunch of equations that are going to represent making things as fair as possible. And these are the Z equations. So we represent another decision variable Z, and those are the ratios between um, the the organs that end up in a, a particular type of patient compared to the proportion in the population waiting for those organs. And you want those each of those Z variables to be as close to as one as possible. You want them each to be, in fact, what you want to do is you maximize um, the smaller Z, make each of those Zs as close as you can to one. In fact, you can. Um, if we take the data we have for Australia, you can make, you can make it exactly one. You can balance it out almost exactly. Um, not, not quite exactly, but it's almost perfectly balanced. So that, that the, these Zs are essentially um, the, the ratio of how fair it is for you, whether, whether there are more organs, whether, the, whether you can make the green bar essentially um, equal to the orange bar that you saw in the previous graphs. Um, and so we maximize the minimum of all those. That's easy. This is a nice, simple linear program. And you can put that, um, we can actually, I can actually give you the data. Here's the input data of all the constants. Uh, so you see, if we look at the, the B column, you see P is the 14.4% of of patients, recipients waiting for, for type B organs, and the um, O row, the 10.1% of, um, 
of organs being donated of, of blood type B. So that's the input data. There are all the constants in, in that linear program. And now we solve for the x's, and the x's define the z's, but um, um, we can solve for the x's. And here's the solution. You find this is the optimal solution. The diagonal in this, in this table now are all the organs that stay um, uh, in the same um, blood type. So 44.6% um, of the donated organs are, are blood type O, and they go to patients of blood type O. 39.3% of the organs um, that were donated were blood type A and, and um, go to patients of type A. Uh, we had 10.1% organs of type B that go to patients of type B. And there's one only one transfer that happens, which is we take 2.7% of the organs that are actually turn out to be of type O and give them to patients of type B. To compensate for that fact that you remember that I said um, the, that the type um, B um, patients were disadvantaged, they were, proportionally speaking, far more of them waiting for an organ um, than any other, other blood type. And so that gives you um, the optimal solution you can, and that, that, that moves as few organs around as, as possible and balances things up so that people of different blood type have as much as you can make it an equal probability of um, receiving an organ. Um, and so these sorts of considerations, these sort of very practical considerations turn into some interesting theoretical um, questions. And this type, it was a linear programming problem that we set up that allow us to, to go back to the surgeons and say, here is the optimal solution. This is for Australia, the optimal solution of how, how many organs you should be transferring uh, between the different blood types to balance things up and make things as fair and we do the same um, with geographical regions australia divided into different geographical regions and um, um, that run somewhat independently but we do fly organs around the country in fact we fly organs to new zealand and back how we can balance things around um, across the different regions um, and then just similarly around the different um, age ranges as well P patients of different age ranges um, there are different portions of those and try and balance those things up as well so there's an interesting interesting lot of balancing going on to try and make things as fair as possible um so that people are not disadvantaged if they're of, of uh, obscure blood type or um, according to their age or their geographical region really important considerations for the system to be fair and for people to use it Okay, so um, the first set of conclusions before we move to the second example, and I think uh, JJ is going to have the second question before we do to that. Um, what was interesting here is that there was a lot of the theory that people had looked at organ matching, but it was these very practical considerations that we really had to take into account that turned into some many interesting theoretical questions, like that one I just told you about blood type transfer um, that we got to solve, and that we wouldn't probably have thought about if we hadn't been motivated, driven by the very practical problem that the surgeons have given us. And now for the second problem, which is about saving the planet. And I think JJ is going to ask another question before we go on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you could please look at your chat screen and then choose the poll option. That's those three little pillars uh, with a one next to it, because there's a poll open. Um, if you can't find the poll, probably you need to uh, to scroll up or right or left or down because then your screen may be just a little bit too narrow and you're missing the poll. There is a poll in the chat section and the poll asks you if you had a supply chain, how would you bill your clients for the transport of goods? Please go over all the options and make your choice. And as soon as you made your choice, then you are allowed to see the answers to this poll. I will make my choice, I will feed it in, and now I can see all the answers coming in, and I can see what the actual outcome of this poll is. So please turn to the poll and start voting on the answers to the question, if you had a supply chain, how would you bill your clients for the transport of goods? Would you tell that client it's a net marginal cost? Would you do a standard rate per kilometer, which 22%, 17%, it's changing all the time, are saying now? Will you do um, um, the number of goods delivered to that customer divided by the total travel cost and then uh, come up with that number? I can tell that I will give you another, well, let's say, 30 seconds to come up with your answers. 
There is 0% for answer over all subsets of custo other customers. There is 26% to I have no clue, which is probably a good thing <laughs> for Toby to do his second part of his talk, because if people have no clue, they will be listening. Um, and yes, I think, Toby, we will close the poll. You could have a look at uh, at the outcome if you can see. Can you see the outcome of the poll, Toby? No, I can't. Sorry, sorry. No, you can't. Uh, I will tell you that it is about roughly 21% for answer number two, 25% for the Amazon Prime answer, and 21% <laughs> for the I have no clue answer. All the others score low. There is a 14% for the standard rate per kilometer. That is roughly the outcome of this poll. We will close it now. Toby, please shed your light on these outcomes. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, I, I know at least 25% of you are going to hopefully learn something um, from, from the next half of the talk. And uh, actually, I, um, given how few people voted for the final option, uh, I hope all of you are going to take something interesting away from, from the second. But it, and again, it's, it's a problem, a research problem I've been looking at with some colleagues um, that takes us directly into the past uh, quadrant. And I would never have um, looked at these sorts of theoretical questions if I hadn't been driven by this very practical application, which is about ultimately saving um, CO2 for this um, very large multinational carbon. It's about how you allocate costs in the supply chain. Um, these, I should say these aren't actually the actual costs that are charged typically by this business. Um, they're used for various other things like negotiating the, the long-term contracts they have with their, with their customers, moving customers to different distribution centers when they discover they're costing them too much, um, focusing the sale force on different regions that they need to have more customers in to make it more profitable to deliver into those regions. Um, but it makes a very material difference to the bottom line of this business. Um, and I say there's lots of other places where you need to do such things, not just supply chains. Um, if you're trying to cost infrastructure, if you're building a new runway, you've got various airlines who are using the airport, how do you divide up the cost between them? Pollutants, carbon costs, a very practical one that there's, um, some colleagues were looking at, which is how you divide a taxi fare between a bunch of people who are sharing the taxi. Um, there's lots of other places um, where you actually have to um, divide up costs and financial settings like um, dividing up um, money in a bankruptcy or risk in a share portfolio. Um, lots of other places where you need to do dividing up costs between a number of different people. Um, so the practical application that was driving us was um, Tip Top Bakeries, anyone in Australia knows this is the people who provide half of all bread in Australia. They, they, they are, there is um, a very large concentration um, of um, bread making into the very large um, industrial bakers that, that um, um, then require, and so the real economies of scale this business has because they use some really huge, great robotic bakeries. Um, but then they have a, a significant delivery problem. It's Australia, so the distances are large. Um, they have 20,000 odd customers. This is supermarkets, petrol stations, uh, corner stores, all the people who are selling bread um, from a small number of, of um, robotic bakeries. Um, and they run 600 odd vehicles every day. Um, bread, of course, goes off, so you've got to deliver it with great frequency. Um, and they spend, it's a, they have a billion, uh, several billion dollar turnover, and um, several hundred million dollars of that is pure transport costs. Um, and bread is a very um, competitive business these days. Supermarkets drive the price down. And um, so these businesses work on paper thin margins. They really do. Their main, main competitor went out of business recently because they weren't um, doing too well at um, managing their margins. Um, we managed to make them, depending on the different regions that we worked in, 5 to 10% savings in each of the regions that we helped optimize their supply chain in, um, which was um, tens. 20 or 30 odd million dollars a year to them, which to put it in context, their overall profit last year, I think was for, before we started working with them was, was $40 million. So it nearly doubled their profit that year. This is the only gig I've ever worked on where the CEO says, do what the strange geeky people tell you to do, whatever it is. Um, I've never had such a wonderful um, research gig as that, where, the, where from the very top of the organization, they've, um, they've invested so much confidence in us um, and has won a bunch of, um, tech awards as well. So it's been very nice to receive that sort of recognition. So we've got a supply chain, bunch of different customers. Um, how are we going to divide up the costs, the, the, the petrol costs and the like? 
of delivering to all these different customers. So you're putting all the bread in the back of the lorry and you're, and you're throwing it out of the lorry at various places. How do you deliver it? So this is Birdsville Hotel. Birdsville, if, if you don't know, is a town. It's a one shop town in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the outback. It's a thousand kilometers or more from anywhere else. It's, um, I think, about the most isolated town in Australia. Um, there is only one shop in Birdsville today. But just imagine if someone had the initiative and opened a second shop in Birdsville. Um, you, you can see the extent of Birdsville in this picture, but imagine there was a second shop that was opened. Um, now, the actual, um, the marginal cost to deliver to the second shop would be zero. Instead of throwing it out of the right-hand side of the truck, you'd throw it out of the left-hand side of the truck. It didn't actually cost you anything, net, anything more. So there's zero marginal cost to deliver to that second person. Um, but you can make the same argument for the person, the, the original customer in Birdsville. Um, you know, obviously you can't charge both of them aren't costing you zero marginal costs. So um, marginal costs don't actually work that well. Um, you need something a bit more refined than marginal costs. And it turns out there is, the economists have come up with a wonderful theoretical answer. It's incredibly well-founded. And if you haven't heard of this, this is one of the beautiful ideas to take away from my talk. Um, it's the final answer in your qu quiz. It's the average marginal cost summed over every subset of possible customers. So this is why there's this complex bit of maths on the screen now. You see there's the one over n factorial. n is the number of uh, possible customers. n factorial is the, all the possible subsets of customers. And then you sum, there's the sum, there's a sum, and then there's the cost of adding the, adding your new customer I um, to that subset PI of R, less the, so it's the marginal cost of adding I into the, into the root. You do that big sum over all exponential possible subsets. That sounds a very strange thing to be doing. Let me persuade you why that is the right thing to do. Um, now, there's three fundamental properties that any reasonable person I would tell you would want of, of, uh, a function for computing the cost to every customer. First of all, it should be efficient in the economic sense. It should take all the cost and they should be divided uh, to some customer. You don't want to end up with some of the costs not being allocated to some customer because then you're losing money. Equally, um, you don't want to allocate uh, the cost twice. You want to just divide up the cost exactly. So that's efficiency. Um, the second one is anonymity, which is if you have two customers who are all else things being considered equal, they should be charged the same amount. That sounds pretty reasonable. And customers um, who are essentially the same, the two customers in Birdsville, you, they want to be charged the same. If they were being charged different amounts, they'd be very upset. Um, and finally, a, a fundamental property of monotonicity, which is if the total cost went up, the price of petrol went up, total fuel bill went up for your organization, no one's delivery cost should go down. It would be perverse if all the costs went down. Those three sound very reasonable axioms to insist upon of any cost function. It turns out if you ask for those three, there is a unique answer. And economists have already worked out. It's called the Shapley Valley. Lloyd Shapley won the Nobel Prize for Economics in part for coming up with it. And it's the equation that's on your screen. So we have the perfect answer. It's, it, it, it's the only answer that satisfies those three properties. And it would be hard to dispute those three properties. Um, so econ economists have actually given us a wonderful theoretical answer to this question. Um, but that's where economists sort of left us. They left us to say, well, here is the answer. But then as a computer scientist, I look at it and say, well, well, hang on a second. I've got to compute this. It's an exponential sum. And I don't like adding up exponentials. That takes me too long. And then if I look at each term in that sum, it's me. It's solving the traveling salesman problem, uh, working out what the optimal routing is each time. Uh, well, a vehicle routing problem, because we've got multiple traveling salesmen. That's what we would call a vehicle routing problem. So each of those is an NPR problem to solve. So we've got an exponential sum of NPR problems. That doesn't sound too easy to compute. And in fact, um, we were able to prove quite quickly this particular Shapley value um, in this TSP, or the vehicle routing game, is NPR to compute. And if, in fact, you can prove it's worse than that. You can prove if you want to approximate it to any constant factor, um, there's no polynomial time approximation method that exists, assuming, as most people do believe, that P not equals MP. Um, so it's unlikely to have uh, an exact or, or, or approximate method that has any guarantee. Well, 
that's rather bad news for us because we know we still have to compute these things. We still have to divide up the costs. Um, so we're still left with that problem. And so um, we came up with some very nice methods. I could just talk about them very briefly because I'm running out of time. Um, so we use sampling, Monte Carlo sampling. Many of you will be familiar with that. That's a, a, a very common technique you use in computer science to do such things. And then to compute the, the optimal costs in each of those Monte Carlo samples, we used heuristic methods. We used a large neighborhood search method um, to find out a very close to optimal solution. Um, and you can see here's a graph of how quickly our methods converge to a solution. You see that after 40 or 50 samples in our Monte Carlo sample, we're actually we've got to a very small um, error. Um, and so actually we get some pretty high quality solutions in pretty uh, efficient time. Um, good enough to keep our customer happy, good enough to save them tens of millions of dollars each year. Um, and that, why that's saving the planet is that's not just tens of millions of dollars each year. That's thousands of tons of CO2 that they're not spending on fuel. Um, I should say there, there are many other aspects, like with the organ matching problem, um, besides the computational complexity that we had to deal with that were very interesting. I think I'm running out of time. Um, it wasn't just a one-off problem. We run um, a similar problem every day of the week. So we actually want to come up with um, a schedule that works for every day of the week. Um, actually, we looked at every, we can't look at every possible subset of customers. If you get rid of the Tesco store in Birdsville, then Tesco will get upset with you and they probably won't buy any bread from you in any of their stores. So you have to have either one, all of the customer stores or none of them. Um, uh, anonymity, perhaps, um, we actually, different customers have different amounts of goods. So you actually, maybe you want to take account of the different sizes of delivery so you don't actually treat people quite anonymously. You tre actually treat all customers of the same size anonymously. Um, goods have different weight, size, and cost. And so maybe you actually want to factor that into the costing equation. There's lots of different things. Um, we don't actually end up with a, just what cost function. Actually, we want to know how, how sensitive the cost function is to changes as well, things like this. There's lots of other uh, features that you really need to take about account of if you actually really want to solve the problem for this business. Um, um, so I'm going to end there, but just with the observation, exactly the same conclusion we had from the first slide, which is that the allocation practice was somewhat different to what theory had said. It's not just marginal costs. Um, it's not just the, the basic Shapley value you saw. There were lots of other features that you really have to take account of. But they've taken us to really uh, ask really interesting theoretical questions. So, so we're really firmly in that Pasteur quadrant of where to do interesting work. And so I'd encourage you, when you think about the problems that you are going to work on, to incline yourself into that Pasteur quadrant. I found it's been a, a really interesting and useful place um, to try and focus my research onto. Um, and um, it turns out there are many impactful applications. I talked about some with social value, like the organ bank one, some with commercial value. Um, and um, just when the world goes back to normal, um, we always love having people come to visit in Oz. I'm actually hiring people, PhD students postdoc at the moment. So um, please do check me out on the web for those things um, and come and visit beautiful Sydney when the world um, allows that in the game. So I think um, we can now move to some questions. Yes, we can. Uh, thank you so much, Toby. And um, whenever we can, we will be sure we're coming to uh, to Sydney. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to the uh, question uh, to the chat function uh, on the website, you can post questions. Please take your time to post your questions, and please take time to read other people's questions. Because if you don't have a question of your own, you can like other people's questions by simply clicking on like. I will give this one or two minutes, and then the most popular questions will be chosen by me to uh, be asked to Toby. So I see some questions coming in already from Imdad, from Fatwa, and from another one from Imdad. If you don't have a question yourself, please tell us which questions you like. Imdad just scored one like, I can tell you, on, uh, uh, on one of his questions. So please bring in the questions. I will give you another minute. And please read other people's questions. And if you like other people's questions, please show us by clicking on like, so I know what you feel is the most important question in the list. I think, Toby, we can uh, start with the question by, uh, by Imdat Khan. He says, does the approximate 
or suboptimal solution meet the three requirements of efficiency, anonymity, and monotonicity, which is a hard word to pronounce. So, that, does that, the, that, what is your answer, Toby? So that's a great question. So um, it, it meets um, efficiency, because we actually do end up dividing all the costs. Uh, it meets uh, anonymity, uh, so anonymity, efficiency, and oh, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking. What's the third one? Monotonicity. Uh, monotonicity. Yeah, monotonicity. Uh, yes. <laughs> it, it might not because it's a heuristic solution, and the heuristic can sometimes, um, if you change the problem a little bit, it can actually not. Re um, it may not itself be monotonic, and so that may be reflected in the answer. So it's guaranteed to have the first two properties. Uh, Efficiency, which is good for the business, because they end up not making sure that all of their costs are covered. Um, uh, anonymity, uh, we treat all customers uh, in the same at the same type equally, and so customers are happy that they don't feel like they'd be penalised, and and someone across the street in Birdsville gets charged less for the same delivery. Um, but we cannot guarantee um, monotonicity because the heuristic solution. Um, doesn't give you that guarantee, so we have to relax that. But, but we're we the problem is we have this computational complexity barrier, so we have we we have to give something up. Uh, we know that from a theoretical sense, we have to uh, we can't guarantee everything. Okay, so that's a great question. Thank thank you for the answer. Um, there's another question coming in from from Kingsley. He says, uh, after analyzing these, will the business field and the computer science ever agree? On these formulations for cost allocation. <laughs> oh, well, we found that the business was very happy to to take our um, cost uh, allocations. In fact, they're um, they're now using them um, and saving lots of money. And as I said, I mean, the interesting thing was that their rival business um, actually ended up going out of business. They were bought by a vulture fund, a venture capital fund, and eventually they loaded saddle up with debt, and now they're out. Now they're in bankruptcy. So um, the CEO and the board of this business is incredibly pleased that they worked with us because we were able to actually extract um, significant value that they were missing in their supply chain um, and um, focus the business and the costs uh, appropriately. So um, uh, we hope to be able to sell it to other companies and we certainly have lots of interest. Uh, I mean, the, pro the problem being, um, it does require some skill and expertise and computer scientists to very, it's not something you can put in a sim simple spreadsheet. You actually have to um, model these problems and solve these complex vehicle routing problems to be able to come up with these answers. So it, it did require um, their uh, commitment um, to, to, to back us in it, but um, they're saving a lot of money. And I'm pleased to say also this, they're, they're saving the planet. Um, it's the thousands of tons of CO2 each year as well that they're not using. And the great thing about these, and it really it's worth emphasizing this, is that these aren't one-off savings. This wasn't 20 or 30 million that this company saved once one-off. Every year they're saving 20 or 30 million um, that they would have because it's the, the transport costs that recur every, every year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think we can handle one more question. And there's two questions on the top of the list from Imdat. So could the others please go to the uh, chat screen, check out the last two questions by Imdat and give them likes because I want to have you decide on which of the two I will be passing on to Toby. So please take a look at the chat screen, see the two questions by Imdat Khan on the top of the list and like the one that you like best. The first I, like, the I, I like this because the, we, we're getting one benefit from the pandemic, which is normally you get whatever question the person who stands up gives you. Now we're getting Absolutely. actually, we get the opportunity of getting the question that most people are interested in. I, so actually, Absolutely. Absolutely. We get one positive thing out of the, uh, the pandemic. <laughs> um, and I would like to see some likes coming in, ladies and gentlemen, to the questions of, uh, of Imdat. Please add your likes to the one that you like best. And I will say that the first question that scores three likes will go on to Toby. I will give you a little bit of time here. I can't see any likes coming in yet. There might be two things happening. A might be that you're not liking any of the questions. B might be that the technology is not showing me that you are liking 
either of the questions. Which means that probably I will need to choose. Good. Um, I will do the top one. Uh, Toby, Imdad wants to know, what if we use approximate TSP with provable guarantees rather than heuristics on the sampled problem? This might give guarantee. Does this make yeah, any sense to you? Yeah? Yeah, no, that makes a huge amount of sense. If, um, um, if you have um, approximate methods, this unfortunately wasn't a simple, just a simple TSP. It was it was a vehicle routing problem because we've got uh, multiple TSPs, right? a, a TSP for each of the different trucks. Um, but um, certainly, if if you can um, use uh, uh, an approximate method which comes with a guarantee, then you can try and inherit that into the cost function. It's interesting to think. Um, exactly um, how well the approximation guarantee is passed into the Shapley value itself. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm going to go away and think about um, that. That's a very um, good suggestion. Thank you. Okay, thank you.